I see live. We are live. Live from Phoenix, Oregon. All right. Let's get ready to worship the Lord together. <coughs> Okay, well, uh, I do want to officially, as we get going today, once again, thank Mason for all the labors uh, he's done to make sure that this happens. Um, for fourth annual, it's pretty amazing. We've been able to do this now for four years. Um, so we're going to begin. We got, uh, we're going to hear a, a little bit of worship. Oh, Brian's doing music and, and teaching this morning, so we'll uh, so we'll, just, um, we'll, we'll start with the word of prayer and get a morning going, then I'll introduce Brian after we're done singing. Uh, Heavenly Father, you alone are worthy to be praised. <coughs> Father, for the excitement of fellowship with brothers and sisters, for the excitement of the labor that we can do for all of the things that you are doing in the world and in our lives, we pray, Father, that you would use your spirit to give us peace and focus, that we may learn to abide in Christ this morning, that we can rest and worship him in spirit and in truth, honoring you by believing and magnifying your son. Father, may all that we say and all that we do be done for your glory, both now and forevermore. Amen. 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 All right, let's sing. I was an orphan lost at the fall, running away when I hear you call. Father, you worked your will. I had no righteousness of my own. I had no right to draw me from God, you love me still. And in love before you laid the world's foundation, to predestine you and me at your home. You have raised me up so high above my station. I'm a child of God by grace and grace alone. You left your home to seek out the lost. You knew the great and terrible cost. Jesus, your face was sad. Thank you. 
these days is not just the cost of discipleship in general, but the cost of you know, evangelizing and the growing cost of being very public with our faith. Um, so I ask, your, um, <clears throat> I ask your patience with my voice today. It was sacrificed on the altar of evangelizing Southern Oregon University last night. And I, I left it there. Um, but, but happily, happily, uh, get to do so. So this morning, this is our main our main teaching day. This is the f- first real meat and potatoes day of our conference, and uh, we are incredibly blessed to hear from uh, Pastor Brian, um, who him and Wellspring watching the faithfulness of this body, um, our brothers and sisters to the north of us, um, have been has been more than encouraging. Um, you know, the, again, I, I'm, I'm ecstatic to be able to worship and hear from and equip and encourage each other. Um, and particularly today, we get to start today off by hearing from, um, from our brother, Pastor Brian, and then, and then Pastor Chuck later, uh, later this morning. So um, come on up here, Brian, so we can pray for you. And, um, one more time. 
Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for the faithfulness of your, your servants, and we want to honor those who faithfully minister. And so uh, we are blessed and encouraged um, by uh, Pastor Brian, and we pray that you're in the, you send your spirit to empower the preaching and the hearing of the word this day. In Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Well, I'm glad to be with you guys. I'm um, going to take some tips from Pastor Chuck. I see how it is. You know, if you're not preaching until later, you don't have to show up till later. Right? So, <laughs> but I guess he's coming from Portland, so there's some grace there. Next year, I'll have him do 9 o'clock, and then I'll do 1, and then we'll have him do like 8 after that. <laughs> um, but yeah, this morning I want to... Uh, do an equipping specific for evangelism on uh, the biblical theology of conversion and help us understand what the scripture speaks about regarding conversion, first theologically, and then the, the last part uh, to talk about some methodology in evangelism and how our theology affects our methodology. What, how do you lead someone to Jesus Christ, right? How do we lead sinners to Christ? What do we mean by that? And so before I go there, I do want to say at the outset that in our evangelism, our aim is conversion. Amen. Our aim is conversion. We want to see sinners truly saved. We want to see them truly converted. Now, of course, our ultimate aim is the glory of God and exalting the, the name of Jesus Christ and through our faithful obedience to proclaim the gospel and that we believe that, that evangelism is in and of itself worship to the Lord, even if no one gets converted. Amen. And we encourage ourselves with that, but we also understand and, and should not forget that conversion is our aim. Amen. It is what we are have been sent to, to shoot for, to aim for in our preaching of the gospel. So different than some of the Old Testament prophets that were sent with specific messages to just condemn entire nations, condemn entire cities, okay? We are different than that. We are to warn people of judgment to come, but we've not been sent by God, like Isaiah, to harden hearts so that seeing they do not see and hearing they do not hear. That might be what God chooses to use our evangelism for. He might use our proclamation for that very purpose, but that is not what we have been sent to do. That's not our purpose. What we've been commissioned for. We see 2 Corinthians 3, 6. We are ministers of the new covenant. 1 Corinthians 2, 2. We are to be determined to preach Christ crucified, right? 2 Corinthians 5.19, God has entrusted to us a message of reconciliation. And therefore, we are ambassadors for Christ, God making his appeal through us, imploring people on behalf of Christ to be reconciled to God. That's, that's what we are as ambassadors, to see people reconciled to God. Is that what you're after, saying in your evangelism? Is that what you're after, is to see people truly saved and reconciled to God? Surely we are going to be the aroma of death leading to death for some. And others, Lord willing, the aroma of life leading to life. And that's what we're praying for and hoping for. And, and our hearts ought to be greatly burdened when we do not see the fruit of conversion in our ethics. We ought to be burdened by that. We ought to pray in tears and we ought to preach with mercy in our eyes, really wanting to see lives change, really wanting to see people come off the broad road, enter into the kingdom, to truly see lives change where men and women are born of God and become part of the family of God. Now, we know that that is a spiritual work, and we're going to talk about that more in a little bit. So, yes, it's a divine work of conversion, and that ought to make us feel our helplessness, our dependence all the more on the Holy Spirit that ought to drive us to fervent prayer. It is a divine work, new birth, but that is what we are just to preach for. That's what we've been sent to strive for. We can't produce it, but that's what our aim is, and then we trust God to bring it about. As the great preacher Charles Spurgeon said, we must see souls born unto God. If we do not, our cry should be that of Rachel. Give me children or I die. If we do not win souls, we should mourn as the husbandman who sees no harvest, as the fisherman who returns to his cottage with an empty net. The ambassadors of peace should not cease to weep bitterly until sinners weep for their sins. Amen. So as we talk about conversion this morning, remember, we, that is our aim in our ministry. Now, 
God may have a purpose for us to labor in hard soil and see little or no fruit. And that might be the experience of, of some of us here. And, and when you have months and years of that kind of spiritual drought in your evangelistic effort, right, that can be really discouraging. It's hard. And we often encourage ourselves, again, with that vertical priority that what we're doing is worship unto the Lord, obedience in Jesus Christ. But we can also become cold and indifferent to whether or not people receive our message at all, right? And I don't know if that's where Pastor Brent went last night. I haven't had a chance to listen yet with loveless evangelism. But we ought not to become cold and indifferent. Like, okay, I'm just doing, I'm just doing my duty. Hey, I don't really care if you get saved or not. I just have to tell you this. And then I'm going to, you know, I've done my job, right? That is not the heart of a biblical evangelist. And so we ought not to lose the focus of conversion as our aim. And it, it takes the Holy Spirit to keep our hearts humble when you're laboring amongst um, hard soil and seeing little results. But all the more reason we should press in fervently in prayer and trust in the Lord. So, that's kind of an intro. If conversion was our aim, then let's talk about a theology of conversion. And I'll say at the outset, uh, when I originally put this, this teaching, this training together, um, I had in mind... Um, not knowing who, who's going to be part of this conference, but I had in mind folks from from my church, which um, when I when I came in had been under a lot of the modern evangelism, um, you know, real simple gospel that that you then you were trying to get them to make a decision and, and pray a prayer, and um, not much of a theology of understanding of how one gets saved. And how one, how you lead someone to Jesus Christ, and so I, I'm really approaching it from a ground level. If you have, if you don't have experience, and I see a lot of faces where I know have experience, and this is going to be preaching to the choir. But if you don't have any experience in evangelism, I hope to kind of set a foundation in a specific training here on conversion. So, what is conversion? What is conversion? What is not conversion? There's so much confusion in the church in America today, right? And if if we have our theology wrong on this, it's going to influence our our evangelism, our methodology of how we lead someone to Jesus Christ. And we've seen this just just rampant in the church. Depending on what you believe about regeneration and conversion, is going to determine how much responsibility and power you think you have to save someone, to lead someone to Christ. And and it's going to change how you approach doing that based on your theology. So we're going to talk doctrine. We're going to talk theology this morning. First, the doctrine of regeneration under the, the umbrella of a theology of conversion. Regeneration, doctrine of regeneration, and then we'll talk the doctrine of conversion specifically. But first, the doctrine of regeneration, defined, as Wayne Grudem says in his systematic theology, the secret act of God in which he imparts new spiritual life to us. The secret act of God in which he imparts new spiritual life to us. This is such an important doctrine. So important that when this doctrine gets lost and misunderstood throughout church history, it wreaks havoc on the church, as we're seeing today. And so we need to understand first that the Bible does not teach that man simply wakes up one day and decides of their own free will to be born again. That's not how someone gets saved. Okay, sinners don't just change their own hearts, like a leper, his skin, right? A sinner doesn't change his own heart to suddenly want and love the light that he his whole life has hated while loving darkness. That, that doesn't just happen by a decision of the will, John 3, 19 and 20. So this idea is what is called decisional regeneration, a rampant false doctrine in the church today, most evangelicals today will hold to this in some form or another. And it's really the idea that man has the power to regenerate himself. The ability to regenerate himself, to, to make himself born again. So a parallel to that would be like the Catholic Church, and we would all be in agreement on this, the Catholic Church would teach a baptismal regeneration. In other words, that, that man has the power through the sacrament a baptism to regenerate himself or, or babies, right? And, and, and we would, uh, the reformers obviously rejected that idea, and, and all, the, all the evangelicals today would reject 
that idea of baptismal regeneration. But the problem is we've replaced baptismal regeneration with decisional regeneration, and it's a more subtle uh, error and, and heresy, really, um, that, that now a man in his own decision of his own free will can expressing that free will by walking the aisle, by raising the hand, by signing the card, by visiting the I said yes to Jesus table, by the most popular repeated prayer after me, sinner's prayer, right? By doing this, they can make themselves born again. And what I mean is, and this is how rampant it is, you hear how many times have you heard pastors, you know, they leave their congregation in a sinner's prayer at the end of service, and then they say, if you prayed that prayer right now, the Bible says you've been born again. Wrong. It does not say that. And that is clear as day, decisional regeneration, that you pray a prayer, or you do this, or you, the, the, the pastor kind of creates some kind of manufactured response that if you do it, it results in you becoming born again. No, we understand for a sinner to be saved and believe on Jesus they must first be born again. Amen. Okay? John 3, of course, the, the famous passage there with Nicodemus and Jesus. John 3, Jesus says, unless one is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. For to one, to even see the kingdom, let alone enter by faith, he must first be born by the Spirit, because that's what Jesus says in verse 8. Speaking of the Spirit, he says, the wind blows where it wishes, and you hear its sound, but you do not know where it comes from or where it goes, so it is with everyone who is born of the Spirit. So the work of the Spirit in regenerating a man is a mystery. We do not know when and where he is moving. We're just to be faithful to share Jesus Christ to any and all who will listen. But when the Spirit has moved, like the wind, as he wishes, as the sovereign will of the Spirit. The wind blows where it wishes, not conditioned upon man first through his free will doing something, right? The Spirit blows where he wishes, and when he has, like the wind, you will see the effects. You will see the sinner's repentance. You will see fruit in bearing, in keeping with repentance that the Spirit has regenerated a man to saving faith. Man does not do that of their own free will, because before you are born again, what are you? You're simply flesh. In the John 3 context, it's flesh. Flesh versus spirit. You're just flesh. Jesus says in verse 6 of John 3, that which is born of the flesh is just flesh. It's just flesh. But that which is born of the spirit is spirit. In John 6, 63, Jesus says, it is the spirit who gives life. And my flesh was kind of helpful. <laughs> no. The flesh is of no help at all. Retranslation might say profits nothing. The flesh profits nothing. And so regeneration is a sovereign work of the Holy Spirit, not at all a result of man's flesh, man's decision, man's choice. Romans 9.16, Paul says, So then it depends not on human will or exertion, but on God who has mercy. John 1, 12 and 13. John says, But to all who did receive him, who believed in his name, he gave the right to become the children of God, who were born not of blood, nor of the will of the flesh, nor of the will of man, but of God. So yes, you must receive him. Sinners must receive him. They must believe on his name. That's what we're calling them to do. And they must do that. But the only ones who are going to be able to do that are those who have been born of God. Amen. And he specifically says, not born of the will of the flesh or the will of man. That new birth comes from a sovereign work of God. This is taught clearly again, John 6, 37, where Jesus says, all that the Father gives me will come to me, and whoever comes to me I will never cast out. Verse 44, no one can come to me unless the Father who sent me draws him, and I will raise him up on the last day. 
So for the words of Jesus, it's not that man is not permitted to come, that he's not invited to come, that he's not commanded to come. No, he is. He is. It's, it's not that man, no man may come to me. It's that no man can. No ability. Right? No man can come because they are just flesh, because they are totally depraved, because they are spiritually dead. The Father must draw them first. And when he does, when the Father draws a man, it results in them coming to faith and being raised up on the last day. That's not John Calvin, that's Jesus who said that. Again, the reason why no one can just choose Christ is because we are spiritually dead people. And dead people don't choose anything, right? They don't choose or will anything to happen. Ephesians 2, 1, and you were dead in the trespasses and sins in which you once walked. Then in verse 5 he says, even when we were dead in our trespasses, he made us alive together with Christ. By grace you have been saved. That's regeneration. That's new birth. That's the secret act of God in which he imparts new spiritual life to us, right? Regeneration. That's not talking justification. We're talking about the the new life that comes by grace. You have been saved. Again, not conditioned on man's will. You were dead, and he made us alive in Christ. And then to make it as clear as day, verse 8, you know this verse well. For by grace you have been saved through faith, and this is not your own doing. It is a gift of God. Okay? You are saved by grace through faith. And that is not your own doing. That is a gift of God. And we say amen. But wait a second. Wasn't the faith part my own doing? That was my, that was my part, right? God did it all. He made salvation fully possible, fully available. And then I had to activate that salvation by plugging myself into the system, by deciding to have faith. No. No, all of that is a gift of God, including the faith to believe. This is beautifully illustrated, Acts 16, 14, with Lydia and Philippi, a seller of purple goods. As she was listening to Paul preach, it says, The Lord opened her heart to pay attention to what was said by Paul, and she was baptized. God does that work. As the gospel's going out, the Lord opens the hearts of his people. Again, 1 John 5, 1. The apostle says, everyone who believes that Jesus is the Christ has been born of God. So if you are if you are here today and you are believing, you are believing that Jesus is the Christ, it's because you have been born of God. Well, see, so notice what it doesn't say. It doesn't say if you are if you've been born again today, it's because you believed on the Lord. That's most modern day. Evangelism. If you believe on the Lord, you will be born again. Well, no, we, we believe with all these verses and many more that the scriptures teeth teach that the new birth precedes and enables saving faith. You believe because you've been born again. That's the only way that spiritually dead sinners ever come to Christ, that they ever choose Christ. God does a work in us first by the Holy Spirit so that we are irresistibly drawn to Christ and we are captivated by his glory and we cannot turn away. One point in our lives he was a stumbling block. At one point in our lives he was foolishness. And to so many he still is. What changed? 1 Corinthians 1, to those who are called Christ, the power of God and wisdom of God. That's what changed. We were called. We were drawn by the Father. We were born again by the Spirit. And as surely as a blind man receives his sight, does he see, just as surely as a dead man receives new birth, he believes. He believes. He sees the truth of Jesus now. Now, of course, this doctrine of regeneration goes hand in hand with the doctrine of election in Scripture, that God has freely and unconditionally chosen a people for himself to save. And this was in eternity past, before the ages began. And he he chose this people, specific people, and gave them 
to his son, and the son came and died for them, and then the Spirit is the one who then applies that redemption to us by sovereignly regenerating us to belief. Regenerating who? All those God has chosen. And so it does. It goes hand in hand with regeneration and election. This is what Jesus is getting at in Matthew twenty two fourteen, where he says, Many are called, but what? Few are chosen. Few are chosen. So listen, the gospel call goes out. Repent. Believe. All you are weary and heavy laden, come. Come to Jesus. Find life. Forgiveness for all your sins. The gospel call goes out, but many reject it. As we see most rejected, it would seem, in the Northwest here. And it is because, why? <clears throat> well, Jesus says, because they are not chosen. That's Jesus again. Because they are not chosen. They're called, but few are chosen, and that is why the Spirit has not worked to regenerate those that are rejecting it so that they would believe. He puts it back on God's sovereign will, not man's. Now, if you were to say, wait a second, if I'm understanding you correctly, so you're saying that there are some that are predestined to salvation and they will be regenerated by the Father, well then, what is the point of preaching at all, right? What's the point? Let me speak to that. Firstly, we preach because God commands us to, and that is sufficient reason to do anything. <laughs> My Lord told me. But also listen to what the scripture says about how God chooses to bring about a people's regeneration, right? 1 Peter 1, verse 23, speaking about the new birth, he says, Since you have been born again, not of perishable seed, but of imperishable through the living and abiding word of God, verse 25, and this, is, this word is the good news that was preached to you. So you were born again through the word of God that was preached to you. God's using preachers to bring about this divine sovereign work of regeneration. He says it this way, James 1.18, of his God's own will, he brought us forth, that's regeneration, by the word of truth. He brought us to life. He brought us, he regenerated us. We were born again by the word of truth. The word spoken. His word, his truth. And so we, we get this understanding from scripture that as the gospel comes to a sinner, through evangelists, God speaks through that gospel. That's his gospel. He speaks through it to his own his sheep that he's chosen, and he summons that person to himself. He gives them new spiritual life by the Holy Spirit so that they're able to respond in faith and be justified. God does that through the preaching of the gospel. And so, yeah, God has chosen who will be saved, but does that mean preaching is unnecessary? Absolutely not. It means it is always necessary. It's always absolutely necessary because it's the very means that God has ordained to bring about his, the salvation of his elect. It's what God has chosen to use, and it is a great and glorious privilege, saints. This is how Paul thought about all of his suffering during his missionary journeys. 2 Timothy 2, verse 10, he says, Therefore I endure everything. All that I'm going through, I endure everything. Why, Paul? For the sake of the elect, that they also may obtain the salvation that is in Christ Jesus with eternal glory. <laughs> There's an elect people out there. That's why we're here in Southern Oregon. God has a people that need the gospel. And as Paul says in Romans 10, 14, how can they believe unless they hear? And how can they hear unless someone preaches? In verse 17, so then faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of Christ. Amen. We must preach. And so we should have confidence, folks, when we preach that we should have confidence that there will be fruit. We might not see it. I'm not saying we're going to see it. But we should have confidence there will be fruit. Because God will make his word effective in the hearts of those whom he has chosen for salvation. Amen. Again, we might not see the fruit. And we're not, I'm not saying we're all going to bear the same amount of fruit. Some 30, 60, 100 <coughs> fold, right? 
But sovereignty does not nullify evangelism. Sovereignty undergirds the entire endeavor of evangelism, giving us encouragement that some will be saved. It's not all for naught, right? It, it, it's, it's not all on us to save them either. So if you were at SOU yesterday, looking into the eyes of some of these young people and how brainwashed and lost they are, if you don't believe in election, what hope do you have that you're going to change one of their minds? But because the teaching of Scripture and the glorious mysteries of God's ordination of all things before the foundations of the earth, you can have great hope that he's got you there for a reason, for a purpose. And the Spirit of God can take a Paul on the road to Damascus out to hate on people like you and arrest you and smack you off the high horse blind you with his glory, and just like that, bring you to saving faith. God can do it to all these folks that we're trying to reach with the gospel. Amen. God opens the heart. God saves. It's not on us to save. This is so encouraging. This, this frees us up, right? God is the one who grants the new heart of flesh. He takes out the heart of stone. He, he gives them the, the responsive heart to the gospel. The, the heart of stone is an unresponsive heart. Like a rock, right? But he gives the heart of flesh. And preaching the gospel is the means God uses to bring about that new birth and to save the sinner through faith. And so far from being unnecessary evangelism, really understanding this, it takes on a new significance, a new purpose, a new power, a new, a new confidence, and a new joy. New joy when you understand election and regeneration. So that's regeneration. Let's talk the doctrine of conversion then. The doctrine of conversion. What does the Bible teach us about conversion? We see what the Bible teaches about regeneration, that God it, it precedes and enables the conversion of God's elect. So we have to ask ourselves, what are we as evangelists persuading sinners to do? What is all entailed in conversion? Are we persuading sinners to pray a magical prayer that converts them? Are we persuading sinners to just say yes to Jesus and walk an aisle to an altar? Are we persuading them to be baptized to be saved? Are we persuading them to merely agree intellectually with a set of doctrines? Are we persuading them to join our church? Right? What, what are we persuading them to do if conversion is our goal, our aim? What, what then is conversion? I know many of you know this well. For sinners to be saved, they must... Repent and believe the gospel. Amen. That is what we're seeking to persuade sinners to do. Conversion in scripture is very clearly about faith and repentance. Repent of your sins. Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. This is what we are persuading sinners to do. That is how they are converted. Understanding, of course, that it is the spirit who must regenerate them first. Amen. But that's not our part. We are persuading them to repent and believe. Mark 1.15, Jesus began his teaching ministry saying, the time is fulfilled, the kingdom of God is at hand. Repent and believe the gospel. That was the message of Jesus. And uh, I'm sure you probably heard it from Brother Mason here. He shared a few times about in his past having a, a former at a former church, another fellow elder or pastor at the church, all upset about some bumper sticker he saw that said, repent and believe. And it's like, you can't do that. It's backwards. You have to believe first to be saved, and then you can repent. That's all backwards. The preaching works. And Mason's like, you know, that's just a Bible verse, right? Like Jesus said that. <laughs> Mark 1.15, repent and believe the gospel. Now, a quick aside here, that whole debate about, you know, uh, Lordship salvation is repentance necessary for salvation, right? Those who would promote easy believism, really, they would say you're preaching a work of salvation if you're going to preach repentance. You're preaching a, a work of what they must do to be saved. No, they just need to believe. And then once they're saved, then they, they have power to repent. And listen, the whole debate gets settled when you first come to understand sovereign grace and and, and sovereign regeneration of the spirit. Because is repentance a work? Yes, absolutely. It's a work of God. 
It's a work of God in the sinner. Right? He does it. He grants repentance and faith. And so we're not preaching works. But that, that some of the carnage that comes from not understanding regeneration is then you have all these folks that are saying, well, to be consistent, we, we can't preach repentance because then that feels like we're adding a work to what the sinner must do to... No, they, the decision of their will must first just be believed. And so then you got millions and millions of false converts in the church because you've got a gospel that lacks any call to repentance because you've got a theology that doesn't understand that it's all a gift of God. So important to understand that. Preaching repentance is biblical. It's biblical. This is the response God requires for someone to be saved. Paul preached, Acts 20, verse 21, he said, I have declared to both Jews and Greeks that they must turn to God in repentance and have faith in our Lord Jesus. Turn to God in repentance, have faith in our Lord Jesus. We see in the New Testament sometimes the call to salvation is simply repent for the kingdom of God is at hand. And sometimes the message is simply believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and you'll be saved. Right? It, 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 there's really two sides of the same same coin, faith and repentance. So let's talk about what is faith, what is repentance, how do they relate, what are we asking people to do, persuading them to do when we're witnessing to them. Firstly, faith. Faith. Faith is trust. Faith is reliance, right? It's the same way you would trust a parachute when you jump out of the plane, right? So that means biblical faith is not just wishful thinking, like I, I, I hope my team wins in the game today, right? I, I wish, I hope, I have faith. No, it's not like that. Faith is not, biblical faith is not just intellectual assent to something, agreement with something. Like, yeah, I believe Jesus died for my sins the same way I believe that the Declaration of Independence was signed in 1776, right? I, I agree. I agree with that fact. No. Biblical faith is, is not, as the world would say, blind. Blind. No rationality, no evidence, no reason, just have faith. That's Christians. It's not like that. Biblical faith is more like the word trust. Trust. It is It is rock solid, truth grounded, promise founded trust and reliance on the word of the living God and on the work of Jesus Christ. Right? It's the faith of Abraham in Romans 4.20 421, he was fully convinced that God was able to do what he had promised. So understand, biblical faith throughout the whole of Scripture always is founded on an actual word from God, a promise from God, just like we have with the example of Abraham. And saving faith is specifically grounded in the promise of the gospel. So we're not, when we talk about biblical faith, we're not just talking about generic faith in a God who created things, right? We are talking about specific promises of God in the gospel that we are trusting with all our heart. So that means that um, evangelism is not just going around shouting, believe, 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 right? Well, just shout believe because that's, what, what are they supposed to believe in? There has to be a message of gospel truth and promises and implications that they are trusting in. They need to first have an understanding of the gospel so they can have faith in the gospel. So what are we calling people to have faith in Jesus for? Ultimately, what are, what are, we, what are we trusting Jesus for? We are trusting in our Lord Jesus Christ to give us a righteous verdict before the judge instead of the guilty one we deserve. And we believe he's the only one who can do it. And we believe that he can do that for us freely by grace because of his sinless life, fulfilling the law, and his substitutionary death in our place, paying the penalty for our sins to take away our sins. So we are relying on his life, death, death, and resurrection to take away our sins and to credit us a righteousness, not our own, so that we can be justified and saved. It is a faith that Jesus 
is who he said he is. He is eternal God, almighty, in human flesh. He's Lord, he's Savior, he is the treasure. And it's also a faith in what he came to do through the cross. So we're trusting the person and work of Jesus Christ. When we call people to believe on Jesus, we've got to make it clear that it is faith alone that will save them, right? This is, you, you cannot rely on your own works. You cannot rely on good deeds. You cannot rely on ritual or religion or anything else. You must turn away from self and your own righteousness and turn to Jesus Christ in faith. You must see yourself as woefully insufficient to save yourself. Because that's part of what faith is. It's the, it's the outward look. It's a confession that I cannot earn it. Okay, I, I must receive it as a free gift of grace. Biblical faith. Secondly, let's talk about repentance. Repentance is a turning away from sin. A turning away from sin. So repentance is really the flip side of the coin. If faith, if faith is turning to Jesus and relying on him for salvation, then repentance is that, that turning away from the sin in the direction that we were going, hating that sin, resolving by strength to forsake that sin as we turn to Jesus in faith. Here's how Peter said it to the crowd in Acts 3.19. He said, repent, repent then and turn to God. He said, turn, turn to God so that your sins may be wiped out. Paul told everyone in Acts 26, 20, that they should repent and turn to God. So repentance is a turning, a turning from sin, and, and faith is a turning to God for mercy and grace. So both are absolutely necessary because they're two sides of the same coin of conversion. It's that, that singular act of turning away from sin in repentance and turning to Jesus in faith. Typically, repentance also involves a, a change of mind. Metanoia in the Greek carries the idea of, you know, your whole perception of reality is radically changed. You have the mind of Christ now, right? One moment you're an atheist, you're a humanist, hedonist, Mormon, Gnostic, whatever it is. You have a perception of reality. You have a worldview. And, 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 and through repentance, that your whole perception of reality is changed where you realize I was wrong pretty much about everything I've ever known. Trying to just persuade someone <clears throat> in that for you know five minute gospel conversation. <laughs> how do you how do you change the heart or mind like that, right? It's a work of God again. But man, your whole perception of reality is changed. At one moment, you know, you didn't believe the Bible, you didn't believe the Jesus of the Bible, and the next thing you know, your whole perspective of Christ has changed and you're convinced of the truth of the gospel and your whole purpose in life has changed. You're on a new direction. Repentance is a change of mind. And with that change of mind, we see in scripture also comes a sorrow for sin, right? Repentance includes a genuine sorrow for sin. Second Corinthians 7.10 For godly grief or sorrow Produces a repentance that leads to salvation without regret. Produces a genuine sorrow for sin. Also, repentance includes a personal confession and acknowledgement of our sins and confession of our sins. In other words, we stop excusing, we stop justifying, we stop defending, we stop blame shifting for our sins. We start, we start owning up for who we are and, and the things that we have done. Psalm 32 verse 5, I acknowledged my sin to you and I did not cover my iniquity and try to hide it and try to downplay it. I didn't cover my iniquity. I said, I will confess my transgressions to the Lord and you forgave the iniquity of my sin. As I've already said, repentance includes that turning away from sin and the hating of sin. Listen to Ezekiel 18 verse 30. Repent Repent and turn from all your transgressions, lest iniquity be your ruin. Cast away, cast away all your transgressions from you that you have committed. So repentance includes a, a casting away, a forsaking of your sins and a hating them. You're hating them so much so that you, you would pluck out an eye because it's better to go to heaven with one eye than go to hell with two. You are 
You now, through repentance, are hating sin. Repentance also includes, and, and remember this thing, this is so important, it includes a renunciation of works. Hebrews 6 verse 1 says, speaks of repentance from dead works. So we're, we're not just asking people to tag Jesus onto their life and help save them with all the good work they're already doing, <coughs> right? Repentance means seeing your own works as filthy rags before the Lord, never to be able to justify you. You have to come to a place of abandoning all hope of attaining salvation through your own effort and good works and see that it is only through faith alone in Jesus Christ. This is So Paul speaks about this kind of radical repentance in Philippians 3. Remember, he's recounting his background as a Hebrew of Hebrews and a Benjamite and a Pharisee and zealous to keep the law. And then verse 7, he says, Whatever gain I had, I counted as loss for the sake of Christ. Indeed, I count everything as loss because of the surpassing worth of knowing Christ Jesus, my Lord. For his sake, I've suffered the loss of all things and count them as rubbish in order that I may gain Christ and be found in him, not having a righteousness of my own that comes from the law, but that which comes through faith in Christ, the righteousness from God that depends on faith. Clearest picture of a renunciation of works. True repentance includes renunciation of works. And lastly, repentance includes a turning to God in obedient submission. It's not just about stopping sin, right? It's about now joyfully obeying Jesus Christ. John 14, 5. If you love me, Jesus says, you will keep my commandments. And then that, that desire, that love to obey Jesus, that is... That is what God produces in us through the new birth and conversion, as we've already talked about. But listen to the promise of the new covenant in Ezekiel 36, verse 26. I will give you a new heart and a new spirit I will put within you. And I will remove the heart of stone from your flesh and give you a heart of flesh. And I will put my spirit within you and listen and cause you to walk in my statutes and be careful to obey my rules. True repentance will necessarily lead to a changed life. It's got the Spirit of God in you now. You want to obey God. We don't do it perfectly, but we love Him, and if we love Him, we want to obey Him. Repentance. Repentance encapsulates all of that, and that is why it's such a beautiful summary of conversion. You you repent, you are converted, everything changes. Now, I, like many of you, I've heard people uh, say in one form or another, you know, the whole idea of, like, yeah, I, I, I receive Jesus as Savior, or I pray in prayer, or I have the faith part, right? I believe, and I'm saved, and I'm secure. But I'm not really ready to accept him as Lord or follow him as a disciple. And they won't say it like that, but that's what they're saying with their life, right? That's what they're saying when you bring the commands of Christ upon their life. That is absolute nonsense. As if repentance is optional, um, something that can happen later. Jesus said, uh, Luke 13, 3, unless you repent, you will perish. That's how serious this is. That's how essential and necessary this is. It is a part of the essence of saving faith and true conversion. So, when we're evangelizing, after sharing our gospel, the, the gospel, the historical gospel, our aim is to persuade to persuade them to do what in response? To repent and believe the gospel. To turn from their sins and trust in Jesus Christ. So that means, I mean, if that is the, um, the sales pitch, <laughs> I'm going to denounce that terminology here in a second, but if that's the close, right, then that means that you must have first explained sin to the sinner, right? You must have first Preach the gospel and, and faithfully shown the sinner his sins and shown the righteous standard of God by using the law of God in evangelism so that you can then be bold and actually call them to turn from that sin and believe on Jesus Christ. And if, if we do not confront people 
in their sin and show them the demands of Jesus Christ and his lordship over all their life, then you cannot call them to joyfully repent and, and, and submit to Jesus Christ. And we haven't at that point really preached the gospel. A lot of people want to get around preaching repentance, but you lose the gospel. You lose the gospel because they, they don't want the confrontation of it, right? And you can't avoid the confrontation of a true gospel message because it's a call to repent. It's a call of everything about your life is wrong and at odds with God. And you're going the complete opposite way of what you need to be, right? You can't avoid the confrontational nature of that kind of message. I mean, there might not have to be a conflict that comes from it if God's drawing and working by the Spirit, but it is still, uh, you're, you're standing in the gap saying, turn around. Turn around. Can't get around that. Jesus is Lord, and he will not save any who do not bow to him as Lord. You can't just have him as Savior and, uh, you know, divide Jesus up for the parts that you like him, like baby Jesus and the Savior Jesus, the forgiveness part, but I don't want the commands. No, you can't divvy him up how you like. He is Lord, and he will save those who bow to him. So, in evangelism, don't try to make it easier on people, because that's not our goal. Um, and, and just trying to like, you know, if you just if you just agree with the whole believing on what he did for the cross and how you can be forgiven part, just believe that, and then you know later we can talk about his demands on your life and allegiance to him as a follower. No, right? Because that kind of watered down gospel and unbiblical evangelism has led to millions upon millions of people who think they are saved because they made a decision to pray a prayer, but they've never been born again. They've never repented. A lot of times they've never been told to repent. So let's talk methodology for a little bit. And um, maybe some of you have some some good wisdom on, on some of this as well in terms of your experiences sharing the gospel with people. So what are we to make then of, because uh, I want to be practical, I want to be helpful. What, and this is my, again, when I was preparing this a few years ago, this training, it was for people in my church that are going to say, okay, well, then what do you do with somebody? What do you do with somebody that seems responsive to the gospel? How do you lead them to Christ, right? It's all this, everything's about training the evangelism is how to, how to lead someone through a sinner's prayer, essentially, right? So how do you close the deal, right? How do you lead someone to Christ? How do you seal the deal? And, and if you don't, will they be lost, right? Is it your responsibility, in this conversation, you get some kind of tangible response from them. And I will say again at the outset, yeah, the gospel needs to come to them with that kind of personal, intentional urgency. It does. It needs to come to them with, with that kind of specificity, right? Like, it's not, we're not just telling people about what God did 2,000 years ago and isn't that nice, right? You need to then bring it home and say, what about you? Will you believe? Will you turn from your sins and trust in Jesus Christ today? We need to make it that intentional and urgent and bring it to bear on them personally because hell is real and death is coming for each of us, right? And Jesus is the only way. And so but we don't want to play games with souls. And so, so they say, okay, <laughs> yeah, what you're saying, I want that. What now? What now? Well, I think this is where we need some maturity and we need some discernment and we need to be led by the Spirit and we need to ask some questions in the conversation to discern where they're at, what their understanding is, if the Spirit is really doing work in their hearts or are they just being agreeable? Right? So we do some missions trips to the Philippines and, man, their culture, and you bring a white person into your home and Everyone gets saved because they are super agreeable to do whatever you're asking them to do. So is it just a cultural thing or maybe they have mis misunderstood the gospel? Maybe they've misunderstood what is required of them. And so you don't, don't get all excited. I think we start to get nervous. Like, oh, wow, okay, there's someone wants to get saved. But remember, 
Remember the rich young ruler? He was the most eager, excited, ready convert. And he, right, he rushed up to Jesus. He bowed before him. He asked, how do we say? And Jesus, as we've said before, he would have failed just about every evangelism class in seminary today. What does he do? He totally screws it up. Right? He confronts the man in his sin. He shows the man his failure to count the cost and that he still loves his money. And the guy walks off sad and lost. So just because someone says, yeah, I want that, how can I be saved? And they seem to have a, a positive response, doesn't mean just pray with them and then assure them they are now born again. Amen. Dangerous. Don't do that. We don't need to feel this pressure on us in that moment, right? Because remember, we're not the ones who saved them. We're not the ones who produce the new birth. And so don't think their conversion is really dependent on you. And that will free you up in this moment to be mature and, and you know, hopefully really helpful to this person in this moment. And so you want to ask some good questions to help discern what they understand about what you've shared. You know, is the spirit really at work? Why do you want to be saved today? Are you ready to count the cost? Do you hate your sin? You desire to obey Christ. Is Jesus a treasure to you of surpassing value? Are you are you ready to deny yourself, take up your cross, and follow Jesus in obedience, even if it costs you your life? So you ask me questions. You got, you're trying to get to the heart of whether spirits really regenerating this person is at work within them, or are they still in danger of perishing? Right? That that, that matters, you know, as best as we can discern. And there's just there's too many false converts out there. We can't be guilty of adding to that problem, right? Again, we, we got the parable of the soils, and some receive the word with joy, and they fall away. That's, that's not on, if you're faithfully scattering the word, that's not on you. But if you're practicing unbiblical methodology that is then creating these false converts, that's on us. And that's what we're talking about today. And so we dare not deal deceitfully with men's souls for the sake of feeling better about ourselves, to have some kind of number to report, uh, you know, something to add to our tally. We see that a lot. I had a teenager that approached me with her grandpa. She was attending church with her grandpa and approached me about being baptized. And we chatted for a little bit. She's professing faith in Jesus Christ. I said, I'd, I'd like to talk more. And church was uh, wrapping up. And I was about to leave. And she was leaving out the other door. And she ran over because she wanted to ask a question real quick before she left. And she came up and she, she wanted to ask if being bisexual was a sin, according to the Bible. And so we started talking about it. Yes, yeah, actually, yeah, this is what the Bible teaches and that sin. She's like, well, I'm bisexual. And and as I started to get into it with her, you know, her whole family is part of LGBT. Her mom's lesbian, so-called married to another woman, and aunts and uncles and cousins. And this is, you know, a 15-year-old girl who is, you know, her whole world is this. And that's all she's known until just recently come to church with her grandfather, right? And, and so I, I shared the truth of Jesus with her and what the scriptures say very clearly. And I told her, I looked her in the eyes. And I said, if you're serious about following Jesus, I'm going to tell you right now, this is probably going to cost you most of those relationships, even with your mom. And, you know, I looked at her 14, 15 years old, I thought, no way I'm going to see her again. You know, this is my rich young ruler moment. I'm going to just tell the truth. Eager, but they're going to walk away sad. And praise the Lord, she kept coming back. <laughs> she kept asking questions. I said, you got to go listen to the sermon online. I just preached a few weeks earlier on the whole LGBT issue biblically and and she went and listened to the sermon, and next thing you know, she's showing us text messages with some of the elders that she had been with her mom, saying, no, mom, this is sin. They even tell her mom and the truth. And 
But I, I just remember that moment going home going, well, I'm not going to see. I mean, how can I, how can this, this young lady who's surrounded by all this, it's all she's ever known. She's probably on TikTok, you know, a hundred hours a week. And that's all the world that she's seen too. And, and this one guy over here is going to say, you know, in a short conversation, answer her question. This is what the Bible says. And somehow she's going to be changed by that, right? I just like, I mean, it's got to be sovereign grace. It's got to be a work of God. And, and it would have been, it would have been really easy for me to have just prayed with her and baptized her and added her to the tally, right? Like so many others would. And that is dealing deceitfully with their soul. And so if, if you, let's say you spend some time working with someone, you're speaking to them, answering questions, you're working through their misunderstandings, you're asking these piercing questions, and then the person in front of you seems sincere, they seem repentant, they seem changed, they're saying they believe. What do you do? Never, 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 never should we be telling people that they now need to pray a prayer to be saved. Okay? It is not a transaction where we give God permission to, to make us born again and save us, right? Do not present a prayer as something they do to be saved. I can't say that enough, right? We are not saved by works. You doing a prayer is a work that you can do just as much as any other work. We are not saved by works. We're saved by believing upon the Lord Jesus Christ with faith and repentance. And so, you, you just, I don't know how many people, you probably all encountered them too. Hundreds of thousands of times, not hundreds of thousands, but hundreds or thousands of times. Um, <laughs> people that, why, why do you think you'll go to heaven when you die? Well, because I prayed a prayer. I went to this crusade and I came forward and I decided to follow and I committed my life and I, 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 I. No! It's not about you. Your heart should immediately sing, Jesus, <laughs> because of Jesus, he saved me. He saved me, not something I did. Okay, so be very careful in how you, if you're going to spend time praying with them, do not ever present it like that, right? So let's let's imagine again you have somebody in front of you who's sincere and repentant and changed, and they're saying they believe. What, what do you do? Should we not pray with them? Well, I, I'm saying... Absolutely. What's wrong with spending time in prayer together, right? We should let's let's pray. Let's go in. Let's talk to God right now. Let's talk to God, right? But don't present it like a transaction that'll save them. I, I, and I don't know what some of you guys do, but I typically will say, you know, why, why don't you go in and pray, and, and I'm, I'm going to pray over you, or I'll start. I'll pray for them and, and just let them pray whatever's on their heart. Again, but nothing in this is is about this is how you get saved. I've made it clear. Believe on Jesus. You're believing on Jesus. Let's thank Him. Right? This is, it's really not a sinner's prayer, it's the new believer's prayer. <laughs> because Romans 10, 13 says, all who call, call a prayer upon the name of the Lord will be saved, but how can they call on him whom they have not believed? So the believing comes first, and then they call on him, right? So they, if you're believing, you're saved. <laughs> so it's not the prayer that saves you. But you, but yeah, should, should faith be expressed in prayer? Yes. Always, yeah? I mean, it's like prayer is faith breathed out. And so, why don't you pray or I'll pray over you. And, and so you pray together. Well, so you say amen. Now, should we assure them that they are saved? After you spend some time for it? No. Typical modern evangelism, you train people to lead them in the sinner's prayer. And then you assure them that because of this decision you've made, you are eternally secure. You cannot lose your salvation. Have Never have any doubts that your sins are forgiven because of this moment right here. That is so dangerous. We are not the ones to give assurance. It is the Holy Spirit's job to give assurance. And that is a thing the Spirit does progressively in the, in the Christian life, right? And it would be better at that moment to encourage this new professing believer to what? Get baptized. Get a Bible or here's a Bible. Read your Bible. Come to church or get to a biblical church 
get in church and grow, exhort them to begin following Jesus and begin obeying Jesus, come out and preach the gospel with us, right? And so, so you exhort them in what, now what it looks like to be a disciple of Jesus, and you don't have to have this, this crazy follow-up program that is always the main thrust of evangelism today is follow-up, like we have to chase down all of Christ's converts, right? But I would say you also warn them in this moment, you know, if, if you leave this conversation today and nothing changes in your life, there's no new fruit, there's no new desire for the Word of God, delight in the worship of God, love for the commands of God, no evidence of the Holy Spirit changing your desires regarding sin and holiness, then, then understand that this moment means nothing. This profession means nothing. They gotta press in. They gotta seek him until they see fruit and the Spirit gives, the Spirit gives them assurance. They gotta go make their calling and election sure, as we're all called to do. And so we don't declare people saved. Okay? Pastors do not confer salvation on people Amen. or affirm it or, or assure them of it, right? What does my word mean? What does your word mean? It means nothing. 2 Timothy 2, the Lord knows who are his. The Lord knows who are his. Now, in this way, you can lead someone to Christ. If you have an eager convert in front of you, you can lead them to Christ. I don't like that terminology because a lot of times what, how it's used today is what? Seal the deal. You know, make, you make the sale. You get them saved. You're not getting them saved, right? God saves. And we also don't know the genuineness of their profession of faith. But if, if you want to use the phrase leading someone to Christ, and I would say we should be leading someone to Christ in every gospel conversation we have. Amen. In terms of, I've, I've shared the Christ of Scripture, and I've called them to repent and believe upon Him. I have led them to the waters. <laughs> I've led them to Christ. In that sense, you can lead everyone you share the gospel with to Christ. They're not all going to be saved. <laughs> But we are not manipulating a decision or some kind of manufactured response that we add to the gospel. If they repent and believe, they will bear fruit. So, last question I'll answer then. What about making a public <laughs> confession? What about making a public confession? Shouldn't they publicly walk forward and make their decision? Or, or publicly you know, raise the hand, say the prayer? And I would say... Yes, biblically, they are commanded to confess Christ publicly, but the next step is not walk an aisle or pray a prayer. It's what? Baptism. Baptism is, biblically, the, the public profession of one's faith, that they have been born again. They should make that public and confess Christ in public through means of baptism, not some manufactured response the preacher gives in some kind of invitation. Well, thinking about how this might land on different people who have had a whole different background and church tradition, I, I, I want to also make sure to add, what about all those lives that have been changed and, and people have been genuinely converted through the means of altar calls and sinners' prayers, and, and their lives were genuinely changed, and they, they've never been the same. And again, I want to say I'm, I'm thankful to God, and I'm Humbled that God does his saving work through many different means as he pleases and often in spite of us, Amen. not because of us. But understand this conference is about biblical evangelism, not pragmatism. Amen. <laughs> okay, so if that's the thought that goes through your head, we're not, we are trying to be as biblical as possible, as faithful to the Lord as possible, and more willing, even more fruitful for the Lord. Because of it, but it, this isn't about just doing whatever works. And you can't use, well, this worked as a justification for them <clears throat> you should do it. That's not how Christianity works. Our standard is the Word of God. You can't tell me this just worked and therefore it's good. We shouldn't forsake it. Don't throw the baby out with the bathwater. Yes, we should. If, if it's unbiblical, we should throw it out. The Bible, listen, the Bible never uses results to guide or justify our evangelistic practices. You will not find it. you got to remember Jesus. Was Jesus 
the perfect evangelist? Amen. We'd all have to say amen, right? Amen. Perfect evangelist. And he came to seek and save the lost. And he multiple times turned away massive crowds. And he gave hard teachings. He refused to cater to man's felt needs. And he was only interested in making true disciples. And at the end of his ministry, he only had a few hundred true followers. So if that's the case, you cannot judge Jesus' methods by the results or lack of results. So let me close with this. What is our job? It reminds you of what you know well. Our job is to preach faithfully, to preach Christ and him crucified. Some will believe, some will reject that message. That doesn't mean it's time to change the message or change the approach, right? The message stays the same. I am not ashamed of the gospel of Jesus Christ. It's the power of God and salvation. That's the only message we have to proclaim. And the approach shouldn't change either because we're to preach because it pleased God through the foolishness of what we preach to save those that believe, 1 Corinthians one twenty one. So the world may deem our gospel foolish and and the means of preaching to be foolish, we certainly see that and get that heat even from the church, right? But this is how God saves people. This is how God saves people in a way that absolutely obliterates the wisdom of the world. Humbles the proud. And so let's preach. Let's preach with biblical conversion as our aim. And let's pray and trust God with the results. Amen? Amen. Let's pray. Lord, thank you for this time together. And presence of your spirit here with us, the preaching of your word, the truth, renewing our minds this morning. We're so thankful for that work, God, that you are doing in our midst and that you've called us to do for the sake of the kingdom and spreading the good news of Jesus. We are absolutely humbled that you, God, love us, have saved us, and are using us for eternal purposes that is mind-boggling to us, Lord, knowing that all that we have is grace, all that we have is from you, and that there's nothing in man to boast in, only boast in our Lord Jesus Christ and the cross upon which you died. I thank you, God, for these folks gathered here who want to see us grow to be more biblical in our evangelism, grow to rightly understand conversion, and to practice our evangelism in alignment with what your word says, Lord. So help us. We're always in need of reforming and growing and progressing. So, Lord, we humble ourselves before you, thankful for this opportunity for the conference to do that. Be pleased to minister to the saints here. Be pleased to bring your kingdom here in Southern Oregon this weekend in a mighty way. We pray for all the seed that was already scattered yesterday, the seed of your word among so many that appear to be the, the, the wayside. There's not even a chance for the seed to take root. But Lord, we know that you have a people and that you have chosen. And that is why you planted us here to be your missionaries and ambassadors to Southern Oregon and to this state and to the Northwest. <coughs> God, give us, uh, give us joy, give us power, give us endurance when it seems there's so much hard soil and lack of fruit. Our hearts break, God, because we want to see those amazing testimonies of radical conversion as people go under in the water and come up publicly proclaiming Jesus Christ now. And we've seen some of that, Lord, but we want to see more. Our hearts long for more, God. We pray for fruit. We pray for changed lives. Spirit of God, be pleased to use us. We know we are nothing. We are nothing without you. Use the preaching of your word to save your people. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Thank you, guys.